Well, howdy folks, old Buster coming to you again with a new story. This is called Mexico. Well, I done got all the boys together and was fit to be tied, that's for sure. He was like a worm in hot ashes till they all got there. Well, Hired said, look here, boys, what I got? Well, Walter and Jesse and Buster were just a gawking and a staring at a danged old piece of paper that Hired was a waving around. Well, crumpled up and dirty as all get out, Hired began to read it. It said that there was tigers uh, roaming in the woods in the mountains in Mexico. And there was a festival and folks took to the hills for a ceremony of some kind and whilst they was there several of them see the tiger. El Tigre they called it. Well them mountain folk believed that there was a lost treasure up there summers and that was guarded by them there tigers. Darned if and hired didn't want to go a traipsing up there to see if and he could find his himself one. That's right he wanted to catch his himself a tiger. Well, now the boys all had something to say about that, I tell you. They told Hired that he done plumb lost his in mind. Them things bite. Well, what this here piece of paper said was that there was an expedition planned, and Hired knowed the feller hated it up from over to Little Rock Zoo. The feller was a vet named uh, Randy Aberley. Well, Hired went over there once and helped Mr. Aberley treat some animals he had to have help with, seeing how Hired had a way with them and could calm them down real good. Well, I had met up with Mr. Aberley at the state fair when an elephant and a camel got right fractious when giving youngins rides last year. Well, old Hired and Walter was a moseying around there when all the commotion started up. Walter grabbed up a feed bag that was nearby on the ground and gave it to Hired, and he walked in there easy like and gave him some feed and quieted them down with that soothing and smooth talking of his. The youngins got off the elephant and the camel and there was some frightful youngins a squalling a bit, but all worked out all right. Well, Mr. Aberley was called to shoot him with a tranquilizer, but seen what old Howard was a doing and let him go. Said the folk thereabouts that it was the dangest thing he ever seen a body do with critters like that. Well, anyhow, that's how he got to know Mr. Aberley. Well, Howard went over to see Mr. Aberley and asked him if they could go along on the trip. Now, he promised Buster and Jesse wouldn't get in the way and Walter could help too, and him a wrangling stock. And they used to have horses, mules, and donkeys for riding and packing. Now Walter wanted to take his and Gray, but Mr. Aberley said he'd sure <laughs> have Walter one down there if he need help, so there was no need to take his and own. Well, about then, Jesse piped up and wanted to know more about the treasure with Buster right on his and tail asking the same thing. Well, I told Jesse and Buster what he said in that paper, and what Mr. Aberley told him about it. Said it was a legend and didn't know how true it was, but the local Mexicans and Indians sure enough believed in it. There was evidence of the Spanish conquistadors being there, so there might be some treasure thereabouts. He just didn't know. Well, all of them said to count them in for another adventure, but they all wanted to know if they could take their rifles and shotguns and hired Mr. Aberley would have some of their firm when they got there, though. The expedition had permission from the Mexican government for some to be provided on the trip. The boys all got to getting ready packing, getting permission from their folks and school and all, and it was a right busy time. They was to take off in two weeks. Of course, the boys' folks all talked about the trip with each other and with Mr. Aberley. All them boys had rambled around enough that they knowed to be careful and all, and they was ordered by their malls not to tangle with no tigers. Oh, that hired. Well, the day finally come and the boys left on out early of a Saturday morning in Buster's Fort. They had her all shined up as best they could and greased and oil chained and new tires to boot. They was ready and a rearing and a going on hating south. Not nary one of the boys could speak no Spanish, but all of them know the smattering of it, reckon just enough to get themselves in trouble. Well, I done brought a book along <laughs> with him, I know, and that he done got from Ms. Nix, the school librarian. Buster and Jesse took to practicing on a few words and phrases, but Walter was getting the hang of it better than any of them. Well, they was glad they knowed what they did of Spanish, because getting across the border was a chore in itself. Just getting the right papers and going in the right direction took them several hours, but they finally made it. They come to checkpoints run by the military, and that was a mite difficult with all the jabbering and them little fellers with big silver guns they was a-waving around. Finally, with some water and soda pops and a few snacks, they got on through. 
Once they come to a gas station and the federales and local police was there. They all rode in the back of pickup trucks with grab bars and patrolled the area that way. Now Buster was a pumping his and gas when a couple of them federales nodded at him whilst they was a gassing up too. Well Buster pulled out his and billfold and that's where he kept his and junior deputy sheriff badge he got from Sheriff Gravitt for helping at parades and ball games and such. Well that feller took to a jabbering to the other and they come over and started to trying to talk to Buster. Well, one feller took his and badge out of his and pocket and showed it to Buster and pointed to Buster's badge and his and billfold. Well Buster took his and badge out and showed it to the feller and then it almost come to old home week. There was a grinning and a talking and a back slapping and they even got a camera and had their picture took with Buster and the boys. One of the fellers come out that was driving the truck and he spoke a little passable English. He pointed Buster and the boys in the right direction and showed them on the map of where to go. The roads was a sight better than was expected and that old Ford of Buster's hummed right along. After they got on down the road a piece they come to a highway that was a four lane. It's a toll road believe it or not. Now the boys all changed some greenbacks to them pesos so they had some bills and change on them. Well Buster pulled up to the old toll booth and paid the man by just sticking out his in hand with a bunch of them peso coins. The feller took what he wanted and then Buster drove on off. Well Buster probably didn't get no more than 50 foot or so till some feller directed him off the side of the road. Then some fellers dragged some boards across the front and the back tires with 20 penny nails sticking up from them so Buster couldn't go nowhere unless he got a flat tire on every wheel. Now a wild looking feller come up to Buster and started a jabbering to him and they finally understood he wanted some of them pesos. Well Jesse took some coins out of his pocket and stuck his hand out the window and the feller took him about 40 cents worth of them coins and then the other fellers pulled the boards out the way. Come to find out later that the toll booth was a government man and the other fellers was bandits. Reckon they was so poor they got money any way they could. Heck, that kind of stuff happened four or five times whilst they was driving on the west side of Mexico beside the ocean. Awful pretty on the Pacific coast and they seed some sights, that's for sure. They was hated for the Mexican state of Michoacan and a town called Lazaro Cardenas. That was their jumping off point for the expedition. Well Buster was a driving along and all of a sudden Hire took to hollering to stop the truck. He done seed a young'un with a dang lizard a dangling from a string on the side of the road to trying to sell it. Well Hire gets out the truck and the boy starts in on them pesos again offering the lizard for some of them coins. Now the lizard seemed like he was about half dead and part of his and tail was gone too. Well Hire up and pays the boy some coins and takes the lizard and turns him loose up the road a piece. Said he just couldn't see being mean to the critter. Well, after a bit they come to a place to gas up. And had a little cafe there of sorts. Place seemed clean enough and lots of grinning was a going on and Walter took to ordering some vittles for the boys. Well whilst he was a looking at the menu he told the rest of the boys to looky here what he see. <laughs> Walter told Hire they was about to eat some of his lizard cause that was what was on the menu. It was called an iguana. Well, reckon folks liked them since they was a lap with up of them lizards there in that cafe. Well, Hired only said they didn't get the one he bought. That one was the one that got away. They all had a chuckle over that, but understood Hired and his and way with critters. Now, Hired wouldn't have none of that lizard to eat, but got him some beans and rice and some kind of vegetable dish they was a serving. Said it was plum pitiful eating lizards. As they was driving down the coast, they see little stands with cold drinks and something to eat. Buster pulled into a place that had a right nice view of the ocean and all of them went on in to see what they was a making and a selling. Whew! Some of them fish there was already ripe and smelled to high heaven. Whoo doggies and the drinks was recapped bottles of water on sodas, no telling what was in it. Well of course the boys had coolers with their own water and coke so they didn't buy none and they was cautioned by Mr. Aberley to carry their own plus of some facts. The boys were well provisioned by their malls, I tell you, and each of them had a pocket knife and Buster had a tool kit in the back of the fort. Well, Hire's brothers sent some stuff from the church to give folks in them mountains for goodwill and all. Them two suitcases had all manner of doodads and t-shirts that was donated from the members. That old Ford rolled into Lazaro Cardenas and they found them a hotel called the Hotel Marguerite. 
I had to share a bathroom, but it was clean enough, but the beds was something else now. Now Buster was the biggest of the boys, and whilst he laid on down on the bed, Walter took his in picture. Had one of them cameras that popped a picture right out at the bottom without sending it off to get developed. A newfangled kind Walter got off his and sister Carla May before he left on out. Well, Walter dearly loved to take pictures, and he just had to borrow that from her or she'd never hear the end of it. The old camera was really old Gary Ashland, the feller that was a sparking Carla May. He was done bit by the love bug, so it weren't no problem to get to use that there camera. Now, old Walter was tickled plum pink at taking pictures. Of course, hired, he was taking some, and he was all in the picture taking himself, but it worse than maybe Walter sometime. Ain't no telling how much film he brought with him. Well, anyhow, Walter showed Jesse and hired the picture and asked if and they seed anything unusual about it. Now, Walter said, look real close now. You see, Hired and Jesse was a hauling in their belongings, so they ain't had time to try out the beds, but they sure was looking forward to a good night's sleep. Well, both of them said it looked fine to them, and then Walter said, What about the bedspread? There weren't a wrinkle one in that bedspread, and Buster being the biggest of the bunch, there ought to be at least a wrinkle. Well, both of them agreed to that. Well, Walter told Jesse and Hired not to go flopping down on their beds none too hard, because under that bedspread was solid rock. When they say a bed is hard as a rock, they mean it down there. The whole dang bed was a solid block of concrete, and one of them was just a chunk of plain old rock from a quarry, it looked like. Well, Jesse asked the gal at the desk about eating someplace good and close by, and she turned out to be Marguerite. Her daddy named the hotel after her. She spoke English, too. She had kin in Texas and learned it when she visited where she was down there, she said. The boys figured they'd have a look around town and buy a few things to take with them and for their folks back home. It was a fair sized little town, too. After a little shopping, the boys found a place to eat where they were sent to. After they set a spell and was figuring what to eat, Buster tells them to look out that window. There was a couple of fellers in the back of a pickup truck with a dead cow in the bed. They were chopping off hunks of beef and selling it to another place next door. It was hot and flies was everywhere on that beef and blowing it and it sure weren't clean in the bed of that truck. Buster said he didn't reckon he wanted no beef steak from that place. When the waiter come by, Jesse said he didn't want no steak neither, but just where did they get their meat? The feller just pointed <laughs> out the wonder to them two fellers in the truck. Reckon that's all it took and the boys up and left that place pronto like. They found them a grocery store and went in and bought them some canned goods and other packaged food they could eat easy like. Well, the next morning the hotel owner was there and Jesse started talking to him and said he uh, wanted to wait there. And then he took uh, all the boys in the back and had them sit down at his table. Then his and gal left out after he said something to her. And after a bit, he brung out a pot of coffee and she come back with fresh groceries. Now they had a real fine homemade meal prepared by him and his daughter, and he says through her that he was glad they stayed with him in his hotel. Come to find out, Jesse had a few words with her when they come in last night, and she told her about Paul about it. The gal took a shine to old Jesse, I reckon cause she done told him that she would be back to Texas real soon and sure wouldn't mind him a visiting her. Buster told Jesse, there go them pheromones again. You just got to stop that or you're going to be bedeviled by the gals night and day. Well, Buster was a laughing up a storm and so was hired and water. See, Buster done told them about their trip to Kentucky and none of them told Jesse a thing different from what Buster told them. The three of them went along with the joke and it had old Jesse in a dither, that's for sure. They all know that one of these days one of them gals would get her hooks into old Jesse and there wasn't a thing he could do about it neither. That love bug would get him too. Well, the next day they met up with Mr. Aberley and his party and headed on out to the trailhead to leave the mountains. Well, leave to the mountains. They left their vehicles and busters forward at a little town called Ortega where they picked up the horses, mules, and donkeys. There was plenty of help packing, but Walter jumped right on in and began to get to know the stock. The hired was a visiting Mr. Aberley, so Buster and Jesse went on over to a little storefront and sit down and just watch what all was going on. Well, all of a sudden, Buster tells Jesse to look what was a coming. There had to be the prettiest gal you ever did see walking down the street pushing a baby buggy. 
She was blonde hated and blue eyed and downright movie star quality. Now she wasn't dark as a Mexican usually are, but just as white as they was. Oh, Jesse's eyes bugged out and he said it was the prettiest gal he ever did see. She must have been one of them Castilian Spanish descendants cause she didn't look nothing like the rest of the folks they seen. But she was Mexican and from there is what they found out. Well, Buster said to Jesse that one of these days he'd meet his and match and then he was going to be best man. Well, Jesse said it weren't going to happen but of course later on life it did and Buster was best man. They was a burning daylight, so they headed on up into the mountains and looking for that tiger. Buster and Jesse was getting the lowdown on the treasure from the fellers helping and was going to look for it whilst the rest of them was a tiger hunting. The party worked its way up in them mountains by way of game trails and hacking their way up dry steam stream beds. The fellers seemed to know where they was a going and they made good time to a base camp that was a small ranch near a settlement with eight or ten huts. Now those folks just made do. They were right in genius. They could make anything work. When all of them got to the ranch and tended to the stock and set up camp, they run across the hole about 40 foot deep. Now being inquisitive like, the boys asked one of the fellers that could translate what in the dickens that hole was for. Well, here's the story. They tell that that there was for fellers, these four fellers, that was a digging for treasure and began to dig in this here hole. They got down to about 25 foot and then she plateaued out, benched it out some and then went on down about another 15 foot or so and, go, and come to a rock era pointing due west, 40 foot down. Now they didn't have no modern equipment, just handmade digging tools and baskets to tote the dirt out, all done by hand. You just knowed it was some kind of hard work in that ground and took quite a spell to dig that fur. Well sir, one evening them four fellers went in to a little make-do cantina and was having them some tequila. There come in two of the most beautiful women they ever saw. A fight done broke out with them four fellers drunk and all and them a vine for the women. It come to pass that two of the fellers got killed and one of them went plumb loco over the whole affair. The ranch they was on belonged to one of the surviving fellers and all uh, four of the fellers was friends and them gals just disappeared. Nobody ever seen where they go or nothing. It was thought that the fellers was a digging in a gravesite and the women come to get them fighting each other to leave well enough alone. Well that's how the hole come to be left just like it is now. There was a ladder going down in the hole and Hire just had to see that air pointing west. Now the ladder was homemade with limbs untied together and vines with the, was a mighty rickety to make it that way to say the least. Heck of a thing to tie the vines and whatnot limbs on to some two sticks. Well, Hire took off down that ladder and was talking to the rest of the boys whilst he was a climbing down. Well Hire said it was sure dark in there. Well, all of a sudden Hire done come out of that hole like he was shot out of a cannon. He was a beating and a slapping his himself and a squint like a stuck hog. When he hit solid ground he took off like a scalded dog I'm telling you. Come to find out that the walls in that hole was completely covered with these huge spiders. Now whilst Hired was a hollering, he done swallowed one of them spiders. One thing about Hired, him and critters get along right well, but him and spiders just don't mix. <laughs> he is pure he's scared of them. Well, directly he come on back and he had Jesse and Buster Walter check him all out to see if them spiders was off of his body. Each weren't bit none and was none the worse for wear, but was plenty shook up from them spiders. Well after all that and a losing his watch getting out of there everybody settled in for the night and was ready for an early start in the morning. The party got way up in the mountains and come to a place overlooking the valley down by a river. A pretty place. When they looked out over the valley you could see some fellers a bathing and a swimming about a quarter mile up the river and some women and youngins bathing and swimming about the same distance down river. Heck of a note. Well by the way the hired folks that helped him, they found his watch. Mr. Aberley sent some of his and men down there to parlay with the folks and they all took a rest break and ate their dinner there and waited till Mr. Aberley's men got back. When they come back to where they nooned, they told Mr. Aberley they was on the right track and they had seen that tiger not two days ago whilst out hunting. The expedition saddled up and headed out north by northwest higher in the mountains. They made camp for the night and continued on for three more days without any kind of incident. 
Well, whilst riding by this funny kind of tree, one of the guys said for Buster to try eating this thing that looked like a giant green bean. Well, it was quite tasty. Then there was this ugly looking green fruit that looked like a slick avocado. Fact is, it looked like it was overripe when you cut into it. Now, those local fellers done found out Buster liked his and sweets, and they got him his and sweet for the day. Well, Hire took the first bite. He tells Buster that he just had to try it now. Well, Buster did, and he ate darn near half a dozen of them before he stopped to come up for air. Boy, how they was them things good, he said. Them fellers also would make the best tortillas and some kind of hot sauce with black beans. All fresh and it tasted great. Well, they'd been on the trail for about five days now, and when their desti destination come into sight, there was a mountain stream with three or four scattered huts round about it. Well, after camp was made, the boys living there huddled up for talking to Mr. Aberley and his and guides. They was making plans to find and catch that their tiger. First off, they had to determine if it really was a tiger or a leopard or a jaguar or just what. These folks said El Tigre and didn't back down none from it at all for what they said. They also said they wanted some El Negro Gato. What in the heck was all that about, said Buster. Well, come to find out it was black cats what that meant. Now, it's not what you think. They wanted firecrackers. Reason was the tiger and bears would get on their donkeys or folks at night when they had to the answer to call of nature. The firecrackers would scare them away. Now, if that don't beat all. Well, that night, somebody stayed up all night attending to the fire. Kept it a-going with it, a giving off enough light to light up the whole campsite. Now, when the boys asked why they done that, they was told by one of the guys that it was for the lightning bugs. Well, the only lightning bugs the boy knowed of was the ones back home, and they wouldn't hurt nobody. But, boy, these sure would. They come out at night, and if they bit you, a big hunk of flesh would fall out where they was bit. The fire kept them away. They didn't like the light. Now, these huts of the folks living there were an engineering feat, I tell you. They took bamboo and made the house and furnishings, piped water in from the stream, made an oven for cooking out of clay, and what was left over they used for either utensils or spears. These folks had no personal possessions at all. There was an old man there that had to be in his 90s. One feller and his friend lived pretty close by. Fact is, he gave his daughter to his friend to be his wife. She was in her 20s and him in his 50s, I reckon. You gotta know they was the first white men and Americans these folks ever seen. Now, Hired and Buster and Jesse Walter took a notion to give them folks a few things they brought with them in them suitcases. The boys opened them up and began to pass them out to goodies. Well, there were t-shirts and battery-operated flashlights and other kind of little lights and all manner of doodads. Now, them lights were just a ticket, I tell you. No more tending fires at night with them lights for warding off them lightning bugs. Dang, they was big critters, too. One of the guys swatted one for them to see. Well, Buster didn't give that woman that was took to wife by the older man a little stuffed white bear that was in a suitcase with the other stuff. That was the only personal thing the guy all had. Now, she was plumb tickled to death over that there little white bear. It was all white and fluffy, and she hung on to it for dear life. They give her husband a paintbrush, and that old feller was give a pocket knife a buster. They called him the deer man, because he could run up and down them mountains so fast. Well, them folks sure was appreciative, I tell you. Just couldn't thank the boys enough. The expedition left on out the next morning looking for that there tiger. The boy stayed behind with a couple of guys to translate and look after the boys. Well, knowing them, they had exploring to do, and Jesse and Buster was into looking for that treasure. Walter was taking pictures, and Hired was looking at every critter he could find. Now, it was around about dinner time when Walter seen this hound dog run up to this <laughs> one hut. Now, there was a chunk of liver looking meat that they was fixing to cook up, and that dang dog ate it right there on the spot. Reckon they'd have killed the dog if they hadn't run off. Well, one of the guys, Juan, said it was all them folks had to eat, and now they would have to do without for a spell till they come up on some game. The boys seed one feller pick up a dead skunk and skin him out. He cooked that skunk and made a taco out of it. Boy, was it ever rough to breathe around that part of the woods. Now, another feller was going to pick up a dead snake of some kind, but Buster stopped that. 
He even saw some of them men folk chasing the biggest snake they ever saw trying to kill it and eat it. Heck, the boys didn't know them folks were starving. Well, all the boys and the guys went to gather supplies and feeding them folks around their camp. That stream was ice cold and the boys kept their soda water and what not in there and, and other foodstuffs that needed to be kept cool in the stream. Now, if and you don't think a cold Coca-Cola won't break the ice and get you a grin, you're wrong. Them folks just savored drinking them Cokes, just sipped them and took the bottles with them too. Well, Buster had his and sweets with him and after a bit some young had come out of nowhere from the jungle. Well, Buster gave them some cookies and candy and they was happy as pig in a poking slop as they could be. Well, Jesse and Walter was helping out some of the men folk that was a banging and a rubbing rocks together. Come to find out, these fellers would rub rocks till they was powder and then put it in half of a bull's horn. And it was black inside that, that bull horn, black as pitch. And when the fellers put water to it, lo and behold, you could see the gold. Heck, they was gold mining. Well, after a bit, three men come into camp and confab with Juan and Jose, the other guy. They said if and they wanted to see something, they would take them on a half a day's hike to Mari, and they just might see some of what they were searching for. Well, the boys just couldn't wait till the next day. They had ants in their pints for sure. Buster done been there, if you remember, the next morning they lit out. He didn't want no ants in his bridges no more sitting on that stump. Well, Mr. Averly gave the okay to go, but to stay close to Juan and Jose. They would be packing too, and they would give a pistol apiece, a little Microoff 9mm, light but deadly for protection. The boys were took to see a feller called Benamine. It's Benjamin in English, but it was pronounced ben -a -me. Well, that feller talked and talked and finally asked Buster through one why he should trust him. Well, Buster told the feller he done business on the principles of Jesus Christ, and so did Walter, Jesse, and Hart. He told Juan he know to Jesus from the missionaries from years past and the stories passed down from their ancestors. What the feller showed the boys was a sight for sure. There was what they called a mummy holding a round ball that was took from a grave they dug up. The ball was Chinese with a solid gold nugget inside to make it jingle. The mummy was a statue that was ancient. Benamine mapped out caves in the cliffs where there was treasure and graves of men he did not know of. Benamine gave that ball to Buster, and it being a priceless possession of their people, Buster had to take it or be disrespectful. Then Deer Man come to Buster as solemn as a judge, he brung Buster a rock. Well, Buster didn't want no rock. He had no place to tote it. Juan and Jose said he had to take it because of that pocket knife Buster gave him. Juan and Jose jabbered a while with Deer Man and then he left on out. Well, when he was gone, Juan explained about the rock. Seeing as how Buster and Jesse was looking for gold, he was giving them some. That rock was quartz, and when Juan turned it over, the whole bottom was encased in gold. The old man was giving Buster the location of the mother load. The boys were some kind of excited, I tell you. Well, after a bit, the boys and Juan and Jose struck on out back to camp because dark was coming on. Well, the boys had a whale of a story to tell Mr. Aberley that night for sure. Now, Mr. Aberley said he found tracks, and they sure was big enough to be a tiger. Said they was going to bait a trap for him in the morning and try to catch him. If it was really a tiger, just how in the world did he get in this snake of the woods was the question. It was hard to believe, you know. When the boys went back to see Benamine, he had a tale of a lost mine over in the sta state of uh, San Luis Potosi near a little town called Guadalcazar. Now, it was passed down to him from his and people from the time when they were slaves to the conquistadors. Now, if the boys found gold, would they send back help to save their mango crop? That's how they lived, by bartering their mangoes. Well, of course, the boys said they would. The next day, the boys went through a pass and doubled back into the mountains before turning west to the sea. About there at that point, was water in a pool that was stream-fed in a natural cave in the side of the mountain. The boys decided they'd take a look-see and explore the cave. And Juan and Jose went along too, and they turned on their flashlights when they entered the cave. Now, first off, you could tell it had been occupied in the distant past with the paintings on the walls. Evidence of old fires and scattered artifacts was all about. Then bones was coming into the site. 
The deeper they went into the cave, the spookier it got. Then they heard a growl. When they shined their light in the direction, they saw green eyes staring back at them. Well, the boys run to a small tunnel to one side of the cave, and Juan and Jose said they was going to shoot the first chance they got. Well, that didn't happen. That tiger headed straight towards the boys and knocked back out of the cave where Juan and Jose could get a shot. Now, all four of the boys pulled their pistols and was ready to fire when that tiger stopped dating his and tracks and roared at them. Well, dang, if and higher didn't take to acting like a lion tamer in the circus. Well, that tiger sit right down and roared and pawed the air. About that time, Mr. Aberley come into the cave and the tiger sprang towards him. Mr. Aberley shot him. They loaded the tiger in a cage they built out of that dang tough bamboo and was carting him off back to the base camp. Now, the tranquilizer Mr. Aberley used would uh, took down an elephant, but it wasn't enough to hurt the tiger, though. Now, Mr. Aberley and Hire checked over the tiger and found markings of a tattoo of a Turkish potentate. A Turkish potentate. Potentate. Potentate, I guess. Don't get me to talking all these words now. There was records that was there was a shipwreck down by the ocean some years back, Mr. Aberley said. Reckon since tigers could swim, he made it to the shore and made his and way up here where it was more like his habitat. Well, when the expedition got back to Lazaro Cardenas, the boys told Mr. Aberley that they was going to drive the long way back home. They was hated home by way of San Luis Potosi. Potosi, P-O-T-O-S-I. Well, after Jesse was swooned over by Marguerite at the hotel that evening, the boys left out early the next morning so Jesse and his pheromones didn't have to break another heart. The drive to San Luis Potosi was both beautiful and enjoyable and sad. The poverty was just simply overwhelming. The boys knew poor but never seen the like of these folks before. This here trip surely impacted Buster, Jesse and Walter and Hired for the rest of their lives. All them boys had a big heart, but what they seed here turned their natural goodness to action and moving mountains for helping folks the rest of their lives. They done that together and alone, but they done it. Lots of folks have been helped because of them boys. Well, anyhow, the boys done a little sightseeing along the way and figured to look at them famous cliff divers there in Acapulco. When they drove in and found them a place to stay the night, and generally uh, they wasn't having too much trouble getting around. The boys cleaned up a mite and went to watch them divers and eat some supper there, too, at a restaurant where you could watch them fellers climb the rocks and dive off while eating. Now, most folks there could speak some English, as this here was a major tourist attraction. The boys was enjoying themselves and eating a good meal while seeing the divers, when all of a sudden there was a rumbling and a shaking that was plum scary-like. Heck, fire! They was right smack dab in the middle of an earthquake. Well, only if one of the boys ever been in and sure enough, the last thing they ever wanted to be in. And that's for sure. Everybody there in the restaurant was a hollering and a screaming, and them fellers doing the diving was hanging on for dear life, knocked some of them off of the cliff there and knocked them in the water. All the boys jumped up and was hated for the truck, but Buster, and he got tackled and lashed on to by this big old gal that was waiting on tables there in the restaurant. Well, Buster just couldn't get a loose from that woman. She hung on to Buster Tyler and Dick's hat band the wedge too, I tell you. Well, it wasn't long till it was all over and things settled down a good bit. The woman was a gushing over Buster saying in her broken English that Buster done saved her life. <laughs> Why, he didn't do no such a thing, but to hear her tell it, Buster done saved the town. Well, when Jesse, Walter, and I sat back down at the table, Buster told Jesse not to get too close. Well, Jesse asked Buster why. Was something the matter? Buster said he thought some of Jesse's pheromones was beginning to rub off of him, and he sure didn't want none of the badness, because it seemed to Buster that Jesse was always getting the purdians and him the leftovers. <laughs> Golly darn. Well, Walter hired and Buster just went to howling about them pheromones of Jesse's, and he just sold up like old horny toad. It was funny then, and a dang sight funnier now, I'll let you think on it. Well, Buster got them all loaded up and off the next morning to San Luis. They stopped at a little town, or at least it seemed little, and was going to gas up and eat a bite. When they turned a corner to get to the main part of the town, reckon what they done seed? A Walmart and a McDonald's. 
Now just where in tarnation did they come from? Well, they all went into Walmart, done a little shopping, and got some dinner at McDonald's. Always a surprise and an opportunity, said Walter. You just never knowed what you was going to run into next. Kind of like finding Lou Ann at the rodeo and them Watusi bulls of his. They took off uh, after they ate a bite and only got held up a time or two on the way. But after they got to the middle of the country, folks seemed to be pretty nice. The boys stayed one more night out before they got to Guadalcazar, and it was a right nice hotel and cheap, too. The gals there was sure enough pretty and dressed up real fine, too. Now, this one gal working the desk was a little shy, but you know, Buster, between him and Walter, they talked the brass horns off of Billy Goat. Well, Buster and Walter just was a chatting up a storm, and Buster up and asked her if she was married up or had a boyfriend. She said no, because she had to work hard and help her ma feed her and her brothers and sisters. Walter then says to her, You see that little fella over yonder? She answered she did indeed and thought he was cute. Well, he is the marrying up kind, and he is real shy about talking to gals and wondered if you might say a word or two to him. Well, she said she would, and she'd be off about an hour or so. Well, old Walter just winked at Buster, and they pulled hired over and said to go along with this funning they was going to have with Jesse. <laughs> Oh boy, the gals was named Maria, and she brought her girlfriend with her when she met up with the boys. Well, Buster told them that the gals was going to show them around the town to see the sights. There was supposed to be some lover's leap, and the wedding bell falls close by to see that was real pretty like. Well, they all jumped in the old Ford uh, Busters, and they took on off. They had a nice time of visiting and all, and Maria latched on to Jesse like white on rice. When they got on back to the hotel, Jesse Dunn exclaimed that Maria said awful close to him and got him a mite fidgety. <laughs> oh, Walter said it was just cause they was so crowded and the truck was all. Don't think nothing of it. Well, the next morning when they were checking out, Maria up and tells Jesse she could go with them but would have to come back to get her folks. Well, Jesse looks at the boys and rolled his and eyes. And with his and tongue just a waller and his and hate, he hit that door with sparks coming off of his and boots, I tell you. He was a hollering to hurry on up and let's go. <laughs> there ain't no corn thereabouts, and his and pheromones were popping out all over him. <laughs> of course, the three of them told Maria they'd have, like to take her and her friend and folks on a picnic if she could take them to a grocery store for the makers. It just depended on how Jesse was a feeling. Maria was telling them she could get off and they could take the time for the picnic and Jesse wasn't ailing too bad. They'd all love to go. The three of them said their goodbyes and told her they sure would have liked to go on that picnic, but seeing as Jesse was all ditherated, they had better get on down the road. Well, they left Maria with a bunch of them pesos and paper and coin and told her to take them all out on the boys and was just much obliged for her hospitality. Jesse was a chomping at the bit to get a going, I'm telling you. He was a looking every which way to see if the gal was a pursuing it. Well, they eased on into Guadalcazar around about two in the afternoon and went directly to the church in the center of town. They see the priest there and was a getting on to talking to him when an old gentleman come in and give his confession. Walter said they'd wait till he was done to finish talking to him if that was all right. Well, Walter knowed all about that kind of stuff since he was Catholic too, you know. The boys looked all around the church house and found out it was 600 years old. It had all manner of paintings on the walls and stained glass windows and a bell tire to boot. Now when the priest finished up with the old feller, he took them back to his quarters and offered them up a glass of wine and some fruit. He told them to stay at the hotel down the street and eat there too. It was safe and he would speak to the owner for them before they got there. Also, that old feller that just left would speak to them if a neighbor spring for the coffee at the cafe and tell all he knows about the treasure legend. Well, that priest sure fixed the boys right up and blessed them all and said he just knowed they was good boys. They all said they appreciated that and hoped to see him again soon. Now, the old feller was named Manuel Ortega and he was up in his late 80s but still seemed like he was tougher than nickel steak. The boys met up with him at the cafe and he had another fella there with him named Macario Gallegos that spoke English a good bit to translate. Cario answered to the name of Max, and it was sure uh, short and easy to say that, so 
That's what they called him. Manuel told the boys through Max all about the legend of the Lelouch Mine and Treasure. Fact of the matter is that there is plenty of evidence of the general location of where it is, but nobody has found it in all these many years. They claim is uh, when the Spanish left out, they buried a hundred or so men in the mine and sealed her up tight so nobody could find it. And they ain't found it to this day. Well, Mike said he knowed them parts of the mountains, and the boys said they'd be glad to pay him for his time to guide him. They decided to leave the next morning and see what they could find. Mike said he would meet them at the hotel, and they made up to eat breakfast there and then head on out. Now, it was lucky they had some camping supplies, because they might be out a day or two, according to Max. On the way to the place where you had to walk, Max and Buster stopped, and he talked to several fellers along the way of gathering information. Whenever the boys stopped for Max to talk to some feller, they would break out the doodads and t-shirts they had left. they give every darn thing they had away, including the suitcases. At one place, the fellers was a whacking trees with them machetes. They'd take one swing and take down the tree the size of Buster's arm. They weren't very big fellers either, but they was sure enough stout and them machetes was sharp. Well, Max told him he know the one of them that got in a ruckus and took off the feller's haid with just one lick of that machete. Said the feller's haid just rolled down the road. Well, Max took him to a feller's place way up in the mountains. It took all that old four of Buster's had to make it but they did, and from there on it was to be on foot. They made it there about mid-morning and met a feller that they got to talking about blue fire. He told them wherever they saw the blue fire and dug, there would be some kind of treasure there, whether it be pots or artifacts or gold. It was generally a gravesite. Well, all of them took a little stroll the other side of the feller's garden. He told the boys to get to digging with him because he done see blue fire here the other day. They commenced to digging and sure enough found some grinding stones and pots. He said to keep on digging and danged if and hired a knife didn't strike something. Turned out to be bone. It was the rib cage of a woman, but Walter wouldn't dig no further, he said. Walter told him to cover the dead woman up and leave her be. The feller said to them that the treasure was always underneath the body and if and they kept a digging, they would find something real good. Well, Walter would have none of it, so they let it be covered up the hole in the woman. The feller said he see blue fire in the floor of his house and was going to dig it up and see what was there. That feller put a lot of stock in that there blue fire and Max said so did all the other folks around there. Well, Buster decided to wait at the truck for him whilst they went up in the mountains to where the treasure was supposed to be. You see this was supposed to be a treasure site and the lost mine was in the north of the town. They was supposed to go there if and they didn't find anything here. Well, the first thing the feller done was to tie a rope around the waist of each of them and had them hunker down and duck walk with their heads turned away from the mountain. Now, I know y'all don't think a lot of this is true, folks, but I told you a long time ago, these stories are based on truth. They got a lot of truth in them. Well, Buster wasn't wondering what in the heck they was doing when Max come over and told Buster these folks was right superstitious. They done all them shenanigans cause of a spook called Lechusa. Some kind of owl bird with big old red eyes and when he spied you and looked at you full in the face, the body would kill over Dater and Dornar. Well, Jesse and Hired Walter went along with all that doings and got on out of there finally. Well, Max also said they believed in Santa Rhea magic. There was some kind of a voodoo mixed up with Christian beliefs. The Catholic missionaries taught them way back when. Well, Buster Dunn took him a nap and had a good book to read and plenty of water, soda pop, and snacks, so he was good for the day while they went up the mountain. Now, it was about two hours the boys had been gone when a feller with a shotgun come up on a donkey. Turned out this feller was the son of the guy that lived where they was a visitor. Feller couldn't speak no English and Buster was having a heck of a time communicating. Well, Buster pulled out some sodas and snacks and cookies and candy and offered up some to the feller. Well, the feller must have been in his late 20s, but didn't even know what a television was. Buster called on all the words in Spanish that he knew, plus dug out a hired book he got from his nicks. Finally, them two got acquainted and was getting along mighty fine. They went on into the house and sit for a spell till Buster got cross to the feller that his friends was with his and Paul. 
seemed like he knowed where they was and wanted Buster to come on outside with him. He brought up his donkey and motioned for Buster to get on. Well, it looked like he was going to take Buster to where they was all at. Well, Buster just shook his and hey, no, and said to him, mucho gordo, which means too fat. Well, that little donkey wasn't hardly bigger than a good-sized hound and twerked big enough to haul Buster up no mountain. Buster had this feller to lead his and donkey up by a log, and then he stood on the log and leaned over the back of the donkey. Well, Buster was a trying to show the feller he was just too big for the donkey to tote. Well, when Buster leaned on the donkey and put all his weight on him, that donkey's legs splayed out, he began to bray and pass gas. Buster got off of the donkey's back and he was sure enough proud of that, I know. Well, that feller began to laugh and then put his and donkey in the growl and come back to Buster, still about to bust a gut of laughing. Buster got to laughing at him and they just sit down in the cool shade and had a Pepsi and just enjoyed the rest of the afternoon. Well, after another hour or so, they heard the boys and the fellers Paul coming back down the mountain. Sure enough, Walter was riding the donkey and a grinning like a cat that ate the canary. The boys said they dug up some pots and other housekeeping items where there was blue fire but didn't find no treasure. They all went into the house and Max translated what all was said. Told Buster he sure made an impression on that feller's son who took, uh, took him up on the mountain. Said he was going to shoot you till he gave him a Pepsi. The boys and Max made up to go up north to where the lost mine was said to be the next day. They thanked the feller and his son for their hospitality and left them some of them pesos for good measure. The next morning they all took off to the mountains to the north. They came to a spot that was the end of the line as far as driving was concerned. Walking was the order of the day again. Well, Buster said he'd stay with the truck again, but first they would poke around a bit with Max because he got some information for some things to look at. First off, they found a flagstone road that was said to be built by Indian and Mexican slaves of the conquistadors. It was a heck of a piece of work now. Up on further up the mountain, they found a huge stone wheel that was used to crush the gold ore. Either donkeys, mules, oxen, or horses pulled that wheel round and round day after day to crush the ore to powder. Then there was three vats that was terraced one neath the other. You could see where the water come in from a stream and slowly flowed from one of the vats to the other. The gold was heavier than the dirt and would settle out as the water drained from the vat to vat. So all the evidence was there that a mine had been there, but where in the dickens was it hit? Good question, and Jesse and Buster was aiming to find out for sure. Well, all the boys searched around for a spell and headed on back to town as it was getting on to dark. Max was let out to visit some local town folk and landowners up a mountain, and the boys went on back to the hotel. Well, Max come back over to the hotel and had a meeting with all the boys to report what he found out from the local folks that had title to the land up on the mountain. It seems there was a feller that had found some gold up there but didn't have no resources to get it out, and Max was asked if the boys wanted to buy him out or go into partners with him. Well, Max got all the information said he would see to it that all the paperwork was done up proper with a lawyer there in town. He said he thought it was a deal if they could stick around for a bit and prove it up. Well, the boys talked it all over and said they had to end of the month and then had to get on back in the house. All of them agreed to give it a shot. They had enough of them, pesos and dollars, to get back home and put in the venture, so why not? Well, when Jesse put his and money up, you just knowed it was going to be worth the doing. The next morning, the boys met up with Ernesto and Max made the deal, and all of them went to the lawyer's office and signed some papers as partners. Then they all headed up to the mountain. Well, Ernesto showed them where he done found some gold and how he stumbled up on this here hole in the rock. It was a plum pitiful looking mining operation, nothing but a hole only about big as a number two wash tub. Well, they all sat on down and began to ponder on what to do. Well, Walter, Buster, and Hired all had some experience with their paws blowing stumps and beaver dams and decided dynamite was a ticket to get on into the hole and make it bigger so they could step up the operation. Well, Ernesto and Max went on back to town with Buster and got some dynamite and some supplies for a few days up on the mountain. 
Walter and Hired figured a way to use the old Spanish mining operation and Jesse found an old rod mill without a motor but otherwise was intact. When Buster and the fellers got back they got to getting everything in shape and making a list of things they needed to operate on a shoestring. If a they could do that till they brought in a few chips they'd be on the road folks. Well about four days later everything was in some kind of operating order. Leastwise good enough to make a nickel. It come time to widen that old hole and everybody was anticipating setting off the dynamite. Well Buster done volunteered to set it off and asked Jesse if he wanted to go along. Well Jesse was a mite smaller and could get into the place where Buster wanted to place the charge better than he could. Well Buster and Jesse got everything ready to fire in the hole and Buster told Jesse he forgot some extra sticks if they didn't have enough and asked Jesse if he could place the dynamite on the left side of the hole in a natural crack they saw so they wouldn't have to drill none whilst he went back down to get the extra dynamite in case they needed it. Well Jesse told Buster he'd get it ready and run the fuse back up the hill where they could light it and get hit for protection from the blast. When Buster returned everything was set and ready to blow. Well they hollered down to the others below to get hit as they was ready to light her up. Buster asked Jesse if he'd like to do the honors and blow the lid off of the hole. And Jesse said, sure enough, and here she goes. Well, Jesse set a match to the fuse and they run behind some rocks and waited for the fireworks. Now she was hot and blowed sky high. Only trouble was it took down a piece of the mountain they wasn't fearing on. Well, Buster asked Jesse where he set that charge. Well, Jesse sat on the left side like you told me and showed Buster about where it was. Well, Buster allowed that they done got their wires crossed because depending on how you was looking at the hole, which side was left. Well, about that time, the boys in Ernesto was a hollering to get on down there. Well, Jesse and Buster lit out down there quick as possible, and Ernesto and Max was sure enough in a celebrating mood, a dancing arm in arm, and hooping and hollering. Well, the boys got them all calmed down and asked what there was carrying on all about for. Ernesto began to tell of the legend of the La Luce Mine, of how there was three holes of entrance and how rich it was. Well, that blast took a piece of the mountain and slid it down the east side of their hole and not the west side as planned because of where Jesse placed the charge. When the rock was moved, it uncovered three holes not ten yards, yards from the hole Ernesto was digging in. They had to see what all was in there and Max and Ernesto grabbed some flashlights and crawled into the holes they was uncovered. There weren't no date men in there but some artifacts and Spanish armor and some gold and silver sand cast bars was there too. Now when you looked up in any of them three holes with the flashlight you could see the gold and the vein in the rock. Prettiest rainbow you ever saw running through the mountain about 12 foot wide. Well, samples were took and sent to the assayer to see how rich the mine was, and the results were just astounding. Turned out the main vein asset, uh, assays uh, were put to be 10 ounces plus of gold per ton and a kilo of silver per ton. They done hit the mother load. The boys and Ernesto give Max a piece of the mine to oversee their holdings and made a deal with Mexico mining to mine it on the halves and the lawyer in town to handle their business. Well, Buster had the lawyer send some money and an expert in mango trees back to Benamine like he promised. Ernesto moved on close to the big city of Morelia where his daughter lived and Max got himself a nice little hacienda to oversee the mine. The loose was found and it was in all the news there in Mexico. The landowner made himself a nice living from now on and for his and family and taxes was enough for a new sewer system for the town. Jobs was to be had for the town folk with uh, wages three times what the average worker would make plus bonuses. The priest at the church there in Guadalcazar blessed the mine and a party was thrown for the town folk. The boys bought the hotel and had it upgraded and donated enough money to remodel the church. The fellow that did own the hotel was given a good salary to run the place and new soft beds was put in the room for each one of the boys. <laughs> Lord. Well, when Buster, Walter, Hired, and Jesse left for home, their pockets was a jingle. They were set for life and their folks too. But how much does a feller need? The boys all decided to make a foundation that Jesse had read up on to help folks. 
Whilst they was there, they had a lawyer fix up one legal like to help folks they see that really needed it and had part of their earnings come back to the states to the bank where Walter's sister Carla May worked. The boys got on back home and had some kind of story to tell everybody, I'm telling you. They all went to see Mr. Aberley and checked on the tiger. They give him enough money to send him back to the wild summers in India for a free life instead of being cooped up in a cage. The buster sent the ball back to Max with some money to make sure the folks had enough to eat and some improvements for a better life. Max had to go all the way across Mexico and get runners to go into the mountains to find Benamine and them other folks they see by the stream with the human uh, needs that they had with the lightning bugs. Well, Max reported that Benamine sent some pesos to Buster for help and save the mangoes. Well, Buster just donated, donated that too to the cause. Well, Jesse sent some money to help out Maria at the hotel since there was not a man to help her and her ma since her pa was killed in an accident. And Jesse felt plumb bad about his and pheromones upsetting her like it did. Walter sent some good stock down to the town to upgrade their beef and dairy cows, plus some good gray stallions to sire some good horse flesh for them too. Well, Hired found some good heavy equipment for the town for building and maintaining roads. A wind generator and water plant was got for them too. Well, all in all, it was quite a trip. Reckon some of them guardian angels worked the other side for blessings as well as protecting, seeing how right uh, and the Lord's will was done by the boys. The hand of God had been placed on Jesse, hired Walter, and Buster. They was proud to be a steward of the riches he had provided and in his service for their neighbor in need. Feller once said that a body was born with all the treasures of life. It was just how he squandered them. The boys vowed not to never do that, and they won't. Well, this is old Buster saying have a blessed day and signing out to you. See you next time with another story. Bye now.